Okay, so in this lecture, we're basically going to be covering three different things. The first will be private nuisance, then we'll look at the public nuisance, and lastly, the rule in the Rylands and Fletcher. So in private nuisance, you need two things. These were established in um, Reed and Lyons. So you basically need, need an interference, and you need a reasonable user test. So it's basically saying the reasonable person would be affected that like by this interference in their land. They're not able to use it, they're not able to enjoy it, they're not able to utilise the right of theirs. And this has five elements. So there's locality of nuisance, the sensitivity of the claimant's use of the land, the duration of the interference, public benefit, and lastly, malice. So looking at locality of the nuisance, we can look at Sturges and Bridgman. So here it was saying that the nuisance depends on the area. So if you're in a city, you're expecting to hear a lot of noise outside, such as cars passing by or a tube running, the tube running. Whereas if you're in the countryside, you may not expect to hear such things. There's different nuisances in, in different areas. However, in St. Helens, it says that the locality principle has no effect where there is physical damage. So that no longer applies whether you're in the city or if you're in the suburbs, countryside, anything like that. Then we look at the sensitivity of the claimant's use of the land. So it basically says that for it to be a nuisance, it has to affect the ordinary citizen. It has to be so unreasonable that anyone would be affected by this. So in Robinson, the claimant had exceptionally delicate paper stored on their land and any I think, difference in temperature would ruin this. And it was held here that they weren't actually the ordinary citizen. They were a sensitive user of that land. Next, we have the duration of the interference. So obviously we're expecting to endure some inconvenience at some point in our lives. However, when that becomes a long term thing, it becomes a nuisance. So looking at Hunt, there was a strip blown away from the defendant's factory and it was held to be a nuisance because this had happened before. I think it was three or four years ago, but it had happened. And so defendants should have known that that was a possibility. In Kimbleton Fireworks, the firework display only lasted 20 minutes, so it wasn't really found to be a nuisance. However, the display's debris caused damage, and that was a lot easier to prove. The public benefit um, element basically talks about the fact that despite being a nuisance to the claimant, to the community as a whole, they, they, this is an advantage, it benefits them. This was in Miller and Jackson. So here, rather than giving an injunction, the claimant was awarded damages because the cricket club gave public benefit. It was a lot more important to have them than to shut them down for this effective claimant. Next, we're looking at malice. So to get an injunction, it's an equitable remedy. So to get an equitable remedy, you have to act in an equitable manner. In Chrissy, the, def the defendant taught piano. And the claimant, who was their neighbour in response to the noise, basically started beating trays, shrieking, whistling. And it was held that they couldn't get an injunction because they acted inequitably. Uh, Hollywood Silver Fox Farm is quite similar. They uh, discharged guns. And so the neighbour, the foxes on the other side, refused to breed. They would miscarry. They would kill their young. And so clearly they weren't acting in an equitable manner. Next, we look at who can be sued and who can sue. So in Hunter, it basically says that in order to sue, you need a right in that land. This was really clearly shown by the case underneath um, in Bush. So the uh, claimant basically was being harassed by her ex-boyfriend. And at this time, there was no Protection of Harassment Act. And she wasn't allowed to claim under nuisance because she had no rights in the land. Obviously, the rights belong to her parents. And so this shows that it's quite a strict requirement. Then in Hussein, there's a shopkeeper who was subjected to racism. And it was held by the court that they can't sue the council. They have to sue the people causing the nuisance. And... In Matania, it basically says that you can claim against the occupier of the land. And in Coventry and Lawrence, it says that you can claim against the landlord where they authorise the nuisance either expressly or impliedly. Next, we're looking at defences. So first, we're going to 
there's the voluntary assumption of the risk, there's contributory negligence, and the last one's quite difficult, it's rare to use. It's the 20 year prescription, so this is basically where the nuisance has been in, around for 20 years and then suddenly they're coming to claim. After 20 years it's no longer a nuisance. Then we're going to talk about ineffective defences, which we never do, but here it's quite important because I think the first thing your mind would jump to is, okay, if you bought this house knowing that the tube runs next to it and there's going to be noise, you've come to the nuisance. That was held not to be an effective defence in Sturges and Bridgman. And then also utility isn't really an effective defence. This was shown in Adams and Assel. So here I think they had a uh, fish and chip shop and they were saying this is useful and it's giving the community a sense of cheap nourishment by providing fish and chips. This wasn't effective, the courts didn't allow it as a defence. Lastly, we're looking at remedies. Obviously, with nuisances, it's something that's annoying you, you want to get rid of it. So the most likely thing you're going to want is an injunction. Damages are awarded in lieu of an injunction in certain physics circumstances, these are shown in shelter here, so this is where there's an in the injury to the claimant's legal rights is very small, so it wouldn't be worth granting an injunction. Uh, the injury is capable of being estimated in money, so if it's a broken window or something like that. Uh, the injury can be adequately compensated by a small money payment, and also if it would be oppressive to the defendant to grant the injunction. Lastly, there's abatement, so this is basically self-help remedies. So if there's a light from your neighbour's garden shining in your window, a self-help remedy would be to go and buy blackout blinds. These are basically a lot easier, you don't really have to go off to chase things up as much as less serious. Then we're moving on to public nuisance. So in Attorney General and PYA, it was held that it's not necessary to show that every member of the class has been affected but the nuisance must be shown to injury representative cross-section of the class. So there are, again, elements for this. So there's the infringement of public convenience and safety. So in Remington, they were sending out racially charged postcards to specific individuals. And these were over 600 people. However, because they were specific in individuals, it was held that they didn't have the public aspect and so it wasn't a public nuisance. And again, similarly in Goldstein, I think someone sent salt to their friend as a joke and it leaks in the post, so it's obviously affected a lot of people. However, it was only sent to one person. Again, it lacked this public element. Then we move on to obstruction on and projections over highways can give rise to public nuisances. There's also this idea of the claimant suffering damage over and beyond that suffered by the public and then similarly particular damage. Where the, in the third uh, category this may allow a claim under private uh, nuisance rather than public nuisance and then in the fourth one there's the case of Tate so here the claimant suffered special damage beyond the average river user and so that element had been satisfied. Lastly, we're going to look at the rule in Rylands and Fletcher. So this has strict liability. This is where you have an isolated thing on your land, it escapes and then it goes and causes damage onto someone else's land. And again, there are five elements to this. There's the accumulation of dangerous things on the defendant's land which escape. And then we have to define the meaning of dangerous. So in Rylands and Fletcher, the water was stored in a reservoir, it burst and it caused damage. In Stockport, similarly, there was water in a pipe that escaped, caused damage. In Cambridge Water Co, there was chemicals in the leather, being used to dye leather. They seeped through the floor and then they contaminated the water. We then have to define escape. So the thing that caused the damage has to have escaped. So in Gore, there was tyres, they were stacked and they caught on fire. This fire then went on to damage the building. However, it was held that here it wasn't escape. The tyres hadn't escaped, the fire itself caused the damage. 
the escape is very specific. So it's the things like the water, the chemicals, they actually move from the land. And then we look at who can be sued. So again, on the Rylands, it was the occupier of the land they were sued. And then who can, um, who can sue? It's a claimant with the right to the land who suffered the damage. Lastly, we look at the defences. So if the claimant was at fault, there's no liability. If it was the act of a stranger, so in Lothian, there was an unknown person who blocked a basin and this caused flooding, which damaged the property. There's an act, if it's an act of God, so in Earl and Glasgow, this was defined as something completely unforeseeable by any man. There's also consent and contributory negligence. And here the remedies that we use are mainly damages, but this is because something's basically gone wrong once and you need it to be repaired.